Yeah. Okay, nice to see you too, Jeff. So Natalie, uh, let's see, we have uh, Jeff Daly. Do you know Jeff? I don't think so. Hi, Jeff. Nice to meet you, Natalie. Nice to meet you too. So he, he's a psychiatrist and a child psychiatrist. He trained at Mass General, uh, and he's very, very busy at uh, Spectrum, seeing all kinds of different patients. You, you know Kassara, right? I mean, Kassara, uh, you know, was involved in the grants up at Einstein and also uh, is a psychologist uh, specializing in, um, well, maybe actually, why don't you, why don't each of you just introduce yourself quickly then to Natalie and uh, so Jeff, maybe start with you. Go ahead, say. Sure. Couple. So I, I'm Jeff Daly. I'm a, as Eric said, I'm a child and adolescent and adult psychiatrist, and I've been uh, in clinical practice for about 29 years. And I joined um, Spectrum. It'll be three years in January. I joined right before the pandemic, so it was an interesting start, but uh, things are going really well. Um, the practice is getting very busy, very interesting cases, and uh, it, it's been wonderful. Okay. It's great. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, Amina, do you want to say a couple of words about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Amina Benkuk. I'm a psychologist also mm -hmm. at Spectrum. Um, since I, it'll be two years this coming December. Um, wonderful working at Spectrum and definitely interesting cases constantly. Uh, I specialize in anxiety disorders, autism, and trauma. Those are kind of my niche. I do testing as well. Okay. Okay. And Kassara, you wanna? We've, we've already met. I'm Kassara. I have, I'm a doctoral candidate at uh, Berkhoff Yeshiva. Um, just finishing up my dissertation and I've uh, worked with Eric in different capacities for 12 years. <laughs> and I specialize on um, autism and do testing. And I'm very interested in um, family therapy and family dynamics, uh, particularly in those with trauma and autism. OK, great. Uh, Steve, I see Steve Josephson is on the line. Steve, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. sure. I'm a cognitive behavioral psychologist been in practice for about 40 years, believe it or not, and uh, had uh, taught for many years at Columbia and Cornell, uh, and have had the pleasure of knowing Eric since I think we may have met in Fire Island on the beach in the late 70s. Is that possible? Uh, that's possible, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to know each other over the years. We haven't killed any patients yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. That's a good one. That's good. Good start. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. And let's see, uh, Tarini Vats, you want to just introduce yourself? And... I am, I've been working with Dr. Wallenders for over two years now. I was his research fellow at Prime, and now I'm doing a couple of research studies with him at Spectrum. So, okay, great. Thanks. And uh, Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on with my video, but. Um... It sounds like I'm I'm um, I've known Dr. Hollander the least of everyone here, so I <laughs> uh, haven't had any chance to be on a beach with him or anything like that. So, <laughs> yeah. but um, I'm one of the research fellows in the autism and, and OCS. Um, in a previous life, I was a general surgeon and became interested in non-invasive neuromodulation, and would really love to um, start a TDCS or TAVNS. Uh, program here. Uh, at least that's what, what I'm aiming for. But other than that, I'm, I'm really interested in learning all aspects of clinical research. Nice to meet everyone. Okay, great. And uh, Emily, you want to introduce yourself? My name is Emily. Um, I've worked at the practice for five years, and I'm the practice manager. So I oversee both the clinical and research work. Okay, well, great. Okay, Natalie. Um, maybe you can uh, introduce yes. yourself. Tell us, uh, tell us about your background, and then how you came uh, to this idea of metabolic psychiatry. Uh, 
Yeah, so hi everybody, it's so nice to meet you all. And of course, I know Emily and Eric uh, for a while. I know Eric for more than 20 years. So Stephen, I'm getting close, not 40, not from the 70s, but definitely from the early 90s. And I'm also 42 years in practice, uh, sadly to say, or I guess happy to say, no matter what, how you look at that. And uh, I'm working with a Spectrum for the last five years, I think, in a very kind of a consulting capacity. I see sometimes some consults uh, in predominantly women's mental health because my background is in reproductive endocrinology and uh, obstetrics and gynecology in addition to psychiatry. So I'm triple board certified and I have a long, long academic career uh, in prior Soviet Union and then in, at UCLA and then at Stanford for the last 21 years in both psychiatry and women's health. And interestingly, so just to kind of share with you historical trajectory of getting into met metabolism. So we of course worked with female, specifically, I was interested in uh, specialized in treatment of uh, bipolar illness and treatment resistant unipolar depression clinically at UCLA. And um, one of the studies we done in the 90s was the study of the polycystic ovarian syndrome presentation in women with bipolar illness. And what we found was that it was not necessarily present there, but the metabolism, specifically insulin resistance, were, was the predominant uh, feature underlying the uh, met, met, menstrual and metabolic dysfunction in women with bipolar illness. And so that kind of started that journey for me from about 96 till today. And uh, for many, many years, um, we were working on the hypothesis, which now thankfully had become not a hypothesis, it's kind of well accepted now. So, but for about 15 years, I was trying to prove that insulin resistance, which is the chronic metabolic dysfunction, quite ubiquitous occurring in the periphery and in the brain is a kind of a missing link connecting patients with mood disorders and patients with cognitive illness. And there were a number of researchers doing it on both ends. And so we were very fortunate to contribute significantly to this field. And basically what we are at now is to say that actually metabolic dysfunction is an essential part of the pathophysiology of mood disorders. And not only mood disorders, of course, I would postulate perhaps all major psychiatric illnesses because it's a very basic mechanism which originates in the subcellular structures specifically in mitochondria and then it kind of you know kind of moves uh, from the intracellular to cellular and then uh, all the way vertically and so we observe insulin resistance in the phenotypes in both in mice in rats in humans and um, i was very fortunate to work with bruce McEwen at the rockefeller for many, many years, Bruce and I were good, very close friends and collaborators before he passed. And the, the notion is of the stress, the bio, neurobiology of stress and allostatic load as the main mediators of the um, metabolic dysfunction in mood disorders and then ultimately in patients who have increased risk for cognitive de decline. And um, as perhaps many of you can, can agree, the, the data itself, the studies, the results can lead us on. And so basically what we are now at is to say that trauma specifically, and for those of you who work in trauma, specifically early childhood trauma, specifically emotional abuse, has a very distinct metabolic signature, uh, both on the molecular level and on the systemic level from the standpoint of impaired cognition in individuals of middle age. So we're projecting the early effects of trauma on forward longitudinally onto uh, young adult and, and middle adult uh, adulthood. And so um, in addition to that, we're kind of trying now to we're getting more complex because obviously if 
the insulin resistance, which is a condition you all heard of as part of the metabolic syndrome, uh, which in my mind is a very complex and kind of a clunky construct, but the specific metabolic dysfunction of insulin resistance, which might lead to diabetes, it might lead to depression, it might lead to dementia, all independent leads, so it's not necessarily sequential. Um, that, that is very present in patients who are overweight, right? For, for, that, for those of us who prescribe medications, we know that there is a lot of iatrogenic obesity, especially when we treat with antipsychotics or anticonvulsants. Uh, there's, but there is a tremendous amount of overweight and obesity being associated with mental illness, such as not only bipolar illness, but schizophrenia in particular. And so there's and a trauma, by the way, and PTSD as well. So there is a uh, multifactorial, I would say, modeling of what eventually leads to the met metabolic dysfunction in mental illness. And said that, what we're trying to do now is to kind of dissociate, if you will, or uncouple, where it is specifically an obesity-related inflammation or obesity-related endocrine perturbations, or it relates to in central inflammation in metabolism, specifically at insulin resistance. So um, that kind of led us further uh, Research-wise, we have number, I mean, I, I'm happy to share with you the references of some of your interest, but um, we have many, many imaging studies done, cognitive studies done, looking at what happens in the brain of individuals who have that dysfunction. And the changes are very consistent with what we would say in the early uh, at-risk or early Alzheimer's disease changes. So these are metabolic changes in the critical regions of the brain, such as the hippocampus, parahippocampal area, medial prefrontal cortex. And then we have now the advantage of the measuring the uh, central indices and central cascades of the insulin uh, pathway in the living brain by using the exosomes, which are extra, extra vesicles, extracellular, excuse me, vesicles. So research-wise, we're do doing a lot of great uh, and very interesting things. But clinically, what kind of led us to think of what can we do now before we get to more discrete answers, I would say, from the standpoint of uh, pathophysiology. And that is the um, really approach to understand the metabolic signature of the patient before we start the treatment and then monitoring it through the interventions. And so what we've done for many years, we looked at patients before antipsychotics, before anticonvulsants, then at say 12 weeks post and in various situations. And what we find is consistently, which makes just common sense, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is that if a patient gains weight, their risk for metabolic dysfunction is higher. If they lose weight or their weight neutral, say with lamotrigine and stuff, or gabapentin or any other uh, more weight neutral medications, their, their meta metabolism does not necessarily change. So, but that's not necessarily enough, right? Because we still need to treat patients and we do need to treat them with sometimes what we call weight liable medications, which are associated with weight gain. And so uh, a lot of times, as you all very well aware of, Patients do not like to be treated with medications which cause weight gain. And especially, especially obese patients for some reason, which is not necessarily true. And if you're interested, I'll be happy to entertain that. Um, obese patients who come to us with mental illness, they're even more afraid to take an antipsychotic. Whereas that doesn't necessarily mean that they will gain more weight than a thin patient. But in any case, said all that, we're now arriving at the non-pharmacological interventions, and specifically what I'm interested right now to establish in uh, at Spectrum is the kind of a metabolic psychiatry approach to treatment of patients A, who are just regular patients who have illness and receive treatment as usual for whatever their illness might be, 
but have excessive obesity or any metabolic problems, or to entertain more uh, patients who are treatment resistant. So for example, uh, a treatment resistant uh, OCD or treatment resistant anxiety disorder in, with a comorbid depression, et cetera, all kinds of durations of treatment resistant illness to add uh, some sometimes pharmacological, sometimes non-pharmacological interventions. So let me stay in that for a second. Pharmacologically, it would be, say, uh, an insulin sensitizing agent. Uh, the example would be for those of us who stay in the field for a long time, it started with the rosiglitazone, which had that kind of a yo-yo um, fate with the FDA. Uh, and then the pioglitazone, and the pioglitazone is, is remaining the number one in, the, in its class, and they're called PPRG uh, agonists. So they specifically work with the PPAR uh, receptors, both in the periphery and in the brain. And we showed, and many other re group, research groups showed that adding pioglitazone to a patient who has treatment-resistant or partial response to the medication, to any treatment as usual in mood disorders is associated with improvement of the treatment response. So that would be one of the potential avenues to, to, to suggest. The other is also pharmacological, say, metformin, the old good old one metformin or the GLP-1 agonist, which addresses the metabolism from the standpoint of improving um, insulin resistance by glucagon inhibition. And there are many, many others. There's, you know, you all, I'm sure, have seen Azempic um, commercials. Azempic is, in fact, an extended release and oral preparation for the uh, liraglutide, the medication we tried years ago in patients, again, with insulin resistance and cognitive impairment and so on. So these are potential medications which could be suggested. And then what would happen in a, in a clinical setting, the patient would be, uh, say, I would see the patient, the patient would be evaluated, I would send them to regular lab to do regular labs, no, nothing fancy, which would require out-of-pocket expenses uh, if they have insurance. And then uh, work with, all of you, or either of you, or any of you, to uh, kind of co-administer some some uh, intervention. So non-pharmacologically, what we're arriving at now, and it's fairly new, and that is the uh, dietary intervention, which is not. And I want to kind of precede that by saying that this is not saying to a patient, you know, you are overweight or obese and uh, we need you to start dieting. That would be an occult and, and kind of silly, kind of a, I would say, uh, inadequate approach. But to, to try different in, interactions and what we're trying to do now with the research and with Eric, with Eric's group at uh, Montefiore and uh, at the Spectrum is to do a dosed and time limited dietary intervention in, in first iteration, it would be uh, a ketogenic diet. Uh, alternatively, if people do not want or cannot tolerate ketogenic diet, so it would be like eight to 12 week interact, intervention, not longer than that. And there would be metrics such as say lipids and the glucose and the insulin and all these metabolic markers being uh, checked from time to time. There is another, people do not necessarily like it in the clinical setting, again, not in the research uh, setting, but in the clinical setting, we can do caloric restriction, we can do intermittent fasting, we could do um, just a very, it's a newer one now, stepwise kind of a decrease in the carbohydrate intake to uh, advance patient closer to the ketosis, maybe not necessarily induce ketosis in them. And so those, those things are fairly, I don't know if they're cumbersome. I, I mean, they do, they do require some monitoring. And so what I'm offering is to 
to, to, to be that point person in, at Spectrum. So you might want to ask me, like, what, do I, what, am, I, what am I doing at Spectrum? But so uh, I perhaps omitted to say, so I'm a professor at Stanford still, and I'm also a visiting professor at Rockefeller and, and Einstein, but I, I live predominantly in New York now. And so I am uh, planning to completely be 100% living in New York in the next few months. And uh, I am in New York as it is, but in a tele, telehealth setting, it truly doesn't matter where I am actually. Uh, but I am available and delighted to come to the building. I love that building. I am, I am always considering it a treat when I can walk through Central Park to the 5th and 71st. So uh, delighted to come in and see your patients if you see them on premises or see them virtually. And I work closely with Emily and with uh, obviously with Eric to, to kind of coordinate that. So that's what I would be able to offer. Well, that's a that's a great introduction, uh, Natalie. Um, and this is, you know, a whole kind of field that's sort of taking off now. And obviously, it has implications for all of the patients that we see. So I have basic clinical questions here, because we're a group of clinicians. So I'd like to understand a little bit more. So, you know, insulin is released, it helps glucose come out of the bloodstream and go into uh, different organs, for example. Uh, glucose is a fuel. It also is used by the neurons or the, the brain as sort of energy. And that if there's insulin resistance, well, then the glucose is not coming out of the bloodstream as well, getting into the uh, organs. You're having higher levels over time. Uh, and I, I guess the higher levels in the bloodstream can be associated with a lot of negative sort of downstream effects. So, and, and then you also mentioned that early sort of trauma and abuse is a contributing factor to, you know, mood disorders or dementing disorders or cognitive difficulties uh, as well. So, Tell us a little bit more about how insulin resistance then contributes to the different, you know, clinical psychiatric disorders that we deal with. And then what's the, what, how does this early, you know, trauma and abuse connect with the insulin resistance? Thank you, Eric. It's a great, great set of questions. So yeah, uh, let me go back and kind of do a little more of a preface, I guess, on what insulin resistance truly is. So as Eric just said, insulin is uh, secreted by the pancreas. It's the only, the only organ which secretes. It's in a pulsatile manner and it's essential for the glucose utilization. The condition of insulin resistance is a little bit more complex because it has few steps in it, few, I would say, stages on that. So the first stage is that the peripheral receptors, what we know the best, peripheral insulin receptors anywhere in the body become less sensitive to the circulating levels of insulin. And what ensues is the condition called compensatory hyperinsulinemia. In normal English, I would say it means that it's kind of a clogged sink phenomenon. So there is more free circulating insulin because the receptors do not absorb it, they don't bind it, and it's therefore biologically inactive. That condition, that stage of insulin resistance is not, is not characterized by hyperglycemia. So the glucose levels, if you check a patient at that time, are completely normal. And the only way to recognize it is to check fasting plasma insulin. That condition, that stage could last for years, literally four years in itself. The next stage is that the, the so to speak, the system, the dumb is getting broken and breached in many ways. And then there is the spilling of the glucose into the peripheral blood. 
And that is the stage of the hyperinsulinemia with hyperglycemia. So at that point, if you measure, if you take, if you send patient to the lab, they have mildly elevated glucose, say 100 to 120 and high insulin. That's the second stage. The third stage is when it goes into prediabetes. And at that point, to be perfectly honest with you, mechanistically, there is very, very little opportunity to reverse it. The good news about the first two stages, they're reversible. So one of the main important points, I guess, to start doing anything about it is to reverse the cascade. So unlike in dementia, for example, when we still don't know where we can target the train, where we can anchor the train so it doesn't leave the station, we do know that in insulin resistance con conditions, we do have an opportunity to stop curb that movement towards diabetes. And as you guys know, and I'm sure you know, that diabetes is a treatable disease, but it's not a curable disease. And as long as diabetes happens, all the claims that people reverse diabetes, they are just claims. Diabetes is diabetes, if it's really, if, it, if it's the full blown uh, phenotype. Now about trauma. So what we found, and uh, that's work of my former mentee at Rockefeller and many other people also, looking at the early, by the, by the way, there's enormous literature, psychological more even literature on the early abuse, emotional abuse, and how it uh, exponentially increases risk for mood disorders uh, and amplifies the age of onset um, of, of mood disorders in an individual. But specifically to the mechanism, the early trauma is associated with mitochondrial disruption of the glutamatergic regulation. So there, there are a number of epigenetic modulators produced in the mitochondria, which are deficient. And as a result of that, there is uh, overproduction of a glutamate specifically by, by the glutamatergic M2 receptors. And because they are mostly concentrated in the hippocampus, CA1 and CA3 regions, we do have a substantial level of evidence to say that early trauma has a mechanistic effect in uh, hippocampal dysfunction, whichever so, so to speak, form it would take as a mood disorder or as a potential for early neurodegenerative illness. There are direct links to the BDNF. There are direct links to, to various other neurotransmitters and signaling systems, and specifically to the insulin receptor cascade in the brain. And again, happy to provide references if you're interested in that. In terms of how does insulin resistance fit into the phenotype of depression. I think we're getting a little closer to that, but not really close enough. In terms of where's the chicken versus the egg? Because if it's a child who has been, say, emotionally abused, screaming parents, demeaning behavior uh, at, uh, by peers, by siblings, whatever, whatever the form of abuse had happened. And I'm giving you kind of an exaggerated example of that. What happens first? Does the child develop affective dysregulation with a subsequent compensatory behavior say, I'm depressed, I'm feeling very sad. I want to eat donuts or I want to eat uh, ice cream and that would help me to feel better, which also has a mechanistic uh, value to that because the glucose transporters improve the serotonin synthesis in the, in the brain. But, or if, say the childhood trauma at onset precedes the metabolic dysfunction and the person is developing metabolic dysfunction after they develop mood disorder, right? So where's the mood disorder versus metabolic dysfunction in that path? remains to be seen. What I can say though, is that uh, interestingly, the childhood trauma 
is very clearly uh, tr the, the, the vulnerability to respond. Because not everyone, right? We all know, we cl as clinicians, we know. Not every abused person is developing depression. Not every abused person is developing mental illness to begin with. So there's a certain resilience and there's a certain population who are vulnerable. So what we're doing now, which is I find phenomenally interesting in the research arena, is looking at the fetal programming. So we're, we crawled even backward from the ch early childhood. We go into the maternal fetal transmission of the vulnerability to develop that metabolic dysfunction. And that is where we're kind of sitting to, I think it will help us to understand if there is intrauterine, intrauterine, so during pregnancy transmission of the certain uh, chemical regulatory cascades, which predispose neonate to subsequent vulnerability, both metabolically and emotionally. I have a, I have a question. Um, it's so silly, I feel foolish asking, but um, so some of the meds, like if you look at the neuroleptics that seem to work best involve weight gain. So would your interventions uh, attempt to make them even more effective by interfering with weight gain? Um, it's actually a great question. So, so that's it's it's fascinating question because not every not all weight gain. Again, forgive me for kind of going backward all the time, but uh, insulin resistance is associated with obesity only in fifty percent of cases. So that's true, Russian roulette. So you could have a very obese individual who has perfect metabolism. And I mean, from the standpoint of insulin resistance, or you can have a very thin person who is profoundly metabolically challenged and inflamed. So in an antipsychotic scenario, the pre, so the baseline, right? Pre-administration of an antipsychotic is incredibly important because that gives us the platform which way we're gonna go. So if, for example, we give, if we need to give a patient olanzapine, which I would give happily because it's a wonderful drug, but I know that this drug is associated with a multiple weight gain potential and the uh, metabolic, but metabolic dysfunction potential, I would, know, I would need to know what's at the baseline and then how would I do it? Whether, whether I would just start an antipsychotic, then add on some kind of a metabolic challenge to resolve mm. the, the iatrogenic effect, or I would do it concurrently mm -hmm. but together with an antipsychotic. So those questions, uh, again, I think they're great clinical questions. They would probably depend on what baseline metabolic screen would look like. Got it, that makes complete sense. Yeah. You know, I have a totally other bizarro question. When people have major, you know, uh, typical endogenous depressions, a common feature is dramatic weight loss, which feels to me metabolic, even though they're not eating. And would there ever be a way to identify the biochemistry of that and separate that from the mood uh, erosion and use that in weight loss? Um, you know, this is a great question. You know, nobody looked at that. Not a single person I'm aware of looked at the weight loss. In a typical and melancholic depression, for those of us who, who are old enough to remember that nomenclature, it's a... Uh, it's a cortisol driven, right? So there's a pre significant alteration in the both pulsatility and the absolute concentration of cortisol. And uh, cortisol, funny enough, is completely, I would say, traveling together or commingling with insulin. So in the brain, in the periphery and in the brain, hypercortisolemia is associated with hyperinsulinemia. And so if you think of it, the simple example is the Cushing's disease syndrome, right? In the Cushing's syndrome, 
you have centripetal obesity, very high cortisol and insulin resistance. So, so these things are uh, the, specifically cortisol, insulin, testosterone, and estrogen receptors are all kind of enmeshed uh, among themselves. And, and therefore, number of conditions which we observe in our patients with mental illness, primary mental illness have clear metabolic dysfunction. So the ones who lose weight, it could be a catabolic effect of, of one of these players. Mm -hmm. And we don't know necessarily which. It's interesting because when you start to think of the future and maybe the use of cannabis, uh, yeah. one of the problems has been with obese patients, the munchies. And I've read somewhere that someone had managed to separate, you know, the appetite enhancing properties from the mood elevation. So it's a lot of, a lot of exciting things needs to be discovered, yeah. Uh, Dr. Raskin, if I may, this is this is a really um, interesting um, talk. Thank you so much. There's so many themes um, running through this. It's really interesting. I, um, you're familiar with um, the. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the uh, Bessel van der uh, Kolk's um, work. Um, the issues are in the tissues, and and you know like. <laughs> this whole idea of, of trauma leading to metabolic um, uh, problems um, it, later in life. And I think one of the reasons I think this is so interesting is that of, of course it, it, it's all about me, right? My interests, but like, I'm really interested in, in vagal nerve stimulation and the autonomic nervous system. And, you know, I, and so as I hear you talk, there's all of these connections that are being made with the autonomic nervous system. And, you know, the early trauma affects the sympathetic, parasympathetic balance. And then once you mess up the autonomic nervous system, you mess up everyone's physiology going from, from you know, cerebral uh, autoregulation to the heart, to the gut, you know, met, and then liver. And, and so I, I just think this is really interesting. I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, if you foresee any work in the future using, um, ways to modulate the autonomic nervous system first as a mechanism to treat all of these other other disorders because there's I mean there's a lot of preclinical I'm, I'm not sure if there's a lot of clinical work yet but preclinical work showing that um, vagal nerve stimulation does affect brain and peripheral insulin resistance you're absolutely right Christina and thank you for bringing it up in fact, uh, Einstein School of Medicine has one of the most uh, luminaries in, in that preclinical evaluation of autonomic dysfunction in metabolism. And uh, uh, I, I'm kind of peripherally kind of locked with them in, in discussions of how potentially to proceed. The question is, as you, as you rightfully said, in animals, it's much easier to do than in humans. But if you're interested to develop the VNS and, and various you know, instrumental interventions, I would be very interested to add some metabolic panels. So the good news, I guess, let me just say this, with all the complexity and all the multi, multifactorial inputs, the output is quite simple. simple. The output is, we're trying to help our patients. We're trying to do it better than we've done before. And the interventions are attainable. It's, there's nothing fancy about doing lipid panel and fasting gl glucose and insulin. There's nothing fancy in uh, a kind of adjusting their me metabolism via medication or the diet or any of that. If Christina, for example, you would develop the VNS, that would be at another fascinating way to see if vagal nerve stimulation will actually be comparable, right? Or superior to the whatever intervention we, we have available now. Mm -hmm. But the outcome is still the same. It's a simple monitoring and the and the clinical clinical effect as we do with any patient with the psychometric scales. Other people have uh, questions? <laughs>
You're on mute, Jeff. I can't hear you. Can't hear you. There you go. From, from a, a clinical standpoint, who would be the person you would think about us wanting to refer to this program? Just like as far as, um, you know, we, I mean, obviously we have a lot of patients with metabolic problems. We have patients who are already seeing endocrinology and, uh, you know, very invested in that. But I mean, is there a, a profile of a patient that you think would be someone, uh, you know, our flag should be going up thinking about a referral to this program? Yeah, so, you know, I'm an endocrinologist myself, so I can tell you uh, whenever I see patients, endocrinology is a large field, right? So if they, if they have hypothyroid or if they have any kind of the diabetic issues, that's a little different. But for, what, what I see and the, where we started, we're really treatment resistant to partial responders in major psychiatric illnesses. That's where we begun. So I, if you have a patient who has, say, bona fide endocrine comorbidity, they might as well stay with their endocrinologist. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think any patient who says that they don't do well despite all the treatment, that they gain weight, and I know, I know in my few consults with Spectrum, there's plenty of patients who say that eagerly or readily. Uh, you know, we, I, could, I could potentially try to help. We can do an evaluation intake and then evaluation of the uh, metabolic profile, the panel, and then try some interventions and see. I do not take patients away from anyone. I don't want to do that. So no, I would- no, I understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I would totally work with you, but I would be monitoring that part. So, oh. so instead of you uh, or anyone anywhere, uh, kind of being on their own dealing with those issues, I would be the person doing that. So I would be like kind of a, uh, a partner, I guess, in crime. Great. So Natalie, you're sort of suggesting that, you know, metabolic dysfunction could be a contributing factor to treatment resistance. Mm -hmm. And that uh, in order to really get people into remission, you know, you may need to deal with the metabolic dysfunction and that um, you might be able to personalize the treatment based on, you know, the kind of metabolic workup that you do. So my question is, so, you know, why not put everybody on a, a PPAR uh, agent or metformin or one of these glip agents like Ozempic uh, who would be the uh, patients that might best benefit and which of the different approaches might be best for which sort of individual patients? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so let me just, uh, again, try to kind of go back to endocrinology, by the way, what Jeff was asked, asking. Um, in a regular clinical endocrinology, pre-diabetes, and insulin resistance are not treated medica medication-wise. Everyone is saying to them the standard phrase, lose weight, exercise, don't eat ice cream or whatever you eat. Uh, GLP-1, no, no, none of the insulin sensitizing drugs are clinical standard of practice right now in patients with prediabetes. So until they reach the glucose level, fasting glucose level of 160, they're not treated. What we're trying to do is to take patients who are, we went for, from that standpoint, we might extrapolate it further to various populations, but the only level of evidence we have available now is just looking at those who have mental illness, are treated for that, and are non-responding or responding in part. Uh, whether it would be worth of doing it kind of ubiquitously across the board, I honestly don't believe that because I don't believe that metabolism is equally affecting individual uh, across the board. So there's enormous variability. And that is actually what underlies the 
the essence of research. So I would for now st stay with patients who are treated and who are or developing weight gain or some of the patients, by the way, are developing the alopecia, like on Depakote, right? We have a number of patients who would say, oh, I developed profuse alopecia, I have the um, hair growth, et cetera, et cetera. And that is another sign of met metabolism being just impaired, right? So the question is, what can we go with the medication and treat that? Because that's one of the treatments for the polycystic ovarian syndrome or any type of, by the way, there are a number of uh, hypo, hypo, hypo pituitary, hypothalamic pituitary issues, which manifest exactly the same in the phenotype. So there's many, many ways to skin that uh, phenotype, but I would not extrapolate the findings we have available now on the level of evidence to anyone uh, and kind of a occult administration of these drugs. Plus they have their own side effects. And I would never postulate that giving the person uh, say with obesity and insulin resistance, uh, a drug for longer than three months uh, is something I would do you know, without abandon, I would absolutely make sure that there's some kind of a response. And then if it is, then how it could be uh, extended further. That was very helpful. Thank you so much. I got to run. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, David. Natalie, since um, we have such a large population, uh, at least in, in my practice, a larger growing population of nonverbal, severely autistic patients, is that someone who still is that this program would be open to? Um, it's a great question, Jeff. So actually, Eric and Kassara and I were talking about it research-wise. I think, and there is, a, there is actually a direction in the metabolic psychiatry field right now specific to autistic kids, because as you, I'm sure you know, the ketogenic diet has been quite successful in treatment of epilepsy in adolescents and in children. And so the trick there is not necessarily with the child as much, although of course it is, but with the parents, sure. right? So, and you as a child psychiatrist, child adolescent psychiatrist, you know that the worst part is to deal with the parents. So if parents will buy in, they might attempt that type of intervention with their child at home. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly, I would not postulate that that's, a, that's an easy path. However, uh, as I am now kind of trying to get as much information from various centers in the United States and in Europe about the efficacy of their diet. In children with autism, they're getting, they're, they're putting a lot of effort right now to improve compliance, because if they do achieve even partial compliance, they do see improvement in behavior. They really do. You know, I would just echo that, you know, metabolic issues are a, a huge problem in developmental disorders. So if you look at individuals with autism or Prader-Willi or other conditions, you know, uh, there's a very high proportion of overweight and obesity in that population. Now the, you were talking a little about this uh, maternal fetal sort of transmission associated with trauma. And all, there, there's some data also with uh, uh, metabolic syndrome and uh, overweight obesity in the mothers of individuals who then go on to develop uh, developmental disorders. Uh, so that, I mean, that's of interest and I wonder whether there may be some you know, common mechanisms then by which like uh, maternal obesity or uh, maternal trauma may have some similar kind of mechanisms. That's exactly right, Derek. So mm -hmm. there are two things. Uh, if a woman is obese or overweight even, pre-pregnancy, her risk of developing gestational diabetes is two to threefold. Gestational diabetes, which is supposed to be, or at least was looked at for decades, 
as a time-limited dysfunction pregnancy-related. We now know there, there are tons of data. In the last 10 years, the field absolutely burst with data to suggest that women with gestational diabetes have high risk of developing diabetes type 2 themselves postpartum and subsequent of completely unrelated to pregnancy and their children are at a double risk. One is for diabetes themselves and metabolic dysfunction and two for the effect of dysregulation. So if you think of it, there's a two prong uh, negative risk development, development of just those women who have gestational uh, diabetes. And there are plenty of those. I mean, we have an epidemic of it. Se separately, and as you said, and that is really the most interesting, women who, and we published that, uh, actually Thalia Rabakis, who is my um, former mentee, who is now associate professor at Mount Sinai, she just published second paper in translational psychiatry of um, prior trauma. So women who were abused, say emotionally abused as young women, who go on in their lives, become pregnant and have their babies, they have higher risk for both gestational diabetes and postpartum depression. And now she found epigenetic signature underlying that vulnerability. So we're now getting closer to more understanding more mechanisms. So that's not just behavioral load, right? So to speak, and behavioral challenges women acquire. But I think that it has a profound translational transcriptomic effect, which is then unfortunately is carried forward. There's a, a lot of animal data suggesting that. Uh, Mount Sinai is one of them. They, they have tons of data on suggesting that trauma is transmitted through generations. And uh, so, so I think that we're getting to the point where we, we might arrive at primary prevention. And that would be on the psychological approach, right? So the approaching women who had trauma and coaching them to resolve or helping them any way we can to resolve trauma effects before they become pregnant. And the other is of course, aggressively treating whatever the weight or metabolic dysfunction in pregnancy to avoid that transmission. Well, that's a sort of a brave new world to suggest that, you know, intervention early on with psychological techniques could modify these epigenetic sort of risk factors. Uh, that is a brave new world. <laughs> I think it's very exciting because I think that uh, doing group therapy, individual therapy, or whatever teletherapy with women is much easier than then to pile up medications on their kids or on themselves years and decades later. So I'm, I'm all for, for very early intervention as soon as possible and teaching them actually to develop resilience skills, right? To, to withstand, to learn how to survive the stress, so. Okay, any other uh, thoughts or questions or clarifications? Thank you so much. I'm going to have to run as well. Thank you. It was very interesting. Eric and Natalie, are, are you going to put together some kind of a, a flyer or something we could, some kind of information sheet we could share with families? Actually, I send it to you right there, to you and Emily. I send uh, that little. Did we just you, get one. Yeah, you did send in, uh, so we could send out that uh, email that describes a little bit the metabolic mm -hmm. psychiatry program to everybody. Uh, and you can certainly share it with your patients and then, you know, engage in a discussion and then uh, if appropriate, refer. And Jeff, I, I, you know, your, your comment with regards to all of these uh, individuals with autism spectrum disorders who really are at risk for lots of uh, sure. metabolic issues, I, I think that that would be a, you know, really important 
uh, population. And as Natalie mentioned, you know, we're trying to look at this ketogenic diet in that population and also think of the, the, the mechanisms by which a ketogenic diet work, that there may be other interventions that have similar kinds of mechanism, but I think there would be a real value in doing this yeah. kind of work up in those. Yeah. And, and some of my motivated parents would definitely, if, if you know, they, they could provide that diet and there'd be less cheating going on than yeah. probably my neurotypic patients who are on their own. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, everything will go through, through Emily, through Eric, through Spectrum. So I'm again available to talk to anyone while in person or on a, on a Zoom, whichever way you like. It's totally okay with me. I think that adolescents in general are the best population to, to address aggressively just because we could potentially stem, you know, not necessarily the children with developmental illnesses, but also just adolescents with mood disorders and anxiety disorders and all that. Sure. Because we, earlier we start better off we are with them, right? And just before I stop, Kasara, you 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 got everything from me, right? Uh, yes, I think so. And I was just gonna, in terms of we were talking about the ketogenic diet, Eric and I have looked into uh, 